This is Jeff Deist, and you're listening to the Human Action Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to week two of our foray through human action here on the Human Action Podcast. Now, for some of you who had the opportunity to listen last week with Dr. Sean Rittenauer, we sort of went through some background on the book itself, uh, when it was written, how it was written, how it came to be written, uh, Mises' motivations, and we also tried to get some of you interested in getting this book into your personal collection whether via audiobook or Kindle or in physical form. And again, we will provide the links to where you can purchase this book either in hardcover or very inexpensive softcover on our website and use the code HAPOD, that's short for Human Action Podcast, and you'll get a $5 discount on either. And, and frankly, even, I think even the hardcover is only $20 before the $5. The softcover is very, very inexpensive. And this is a book, I think, if you make it through if you get through these podcasts and develop an interest in it, it's the, it's one of those books that you want to own in physical form. It's not something that you just want to have on your Kindle because it really is, uh, you know, one of those seminal rare books that could change your life. So that said, as discussed last week, we are going to start this week with part one of the book, which is entitled Human Action, Roman numeral section one, and that comprises the first 142 pages, the first seven chapters. And we thought that there would be no better guest for this portion of the book than our great friend, Dr. David Gordon, uh, who is in Los Angeles. Uh, And David, I I was talking to Sean last week about how this is considered, I guess, the philosophical part of the book, part one, where some people, especially math-brained, econ types, uh, perhaps lose a little patience with Mises. Oh, yes, Jeff. Well, I think in uh, for most economists, especially they study the neoclassical mainstream economics, there's very little time spent on issues of method, on what the nature of economic method is. They just start giving them all the equations and models right away. So they're not used to this uh, philosophical discussion. I'm I'm very glad uh, Mises put this in because this is my specialty and this keeps me in business. If it weren't for this section, I probably <laughs> wouldn't have a job. So I'm very glad he has this. By by that you mean that you uh, you have a, a PhD in philosophy. You're a philosopher in, in, hi- in some history. Kind. Well, my PhD is in history, but. All my publication, or practically all my publications, were in philosophy because it's much easier. You just have to come up with arguments instead of doing a lot of research. So <laughs> it was. Uh, so I, I'm very glad. Mises. I think one thing very important will come out when uh, you read Human Action is that unlike most economists or most academics today, who were very narrowly specialized in their own discipline. Uh, Mises had an extremely broad culture. He was familiar with all the main areas of thought, and he could he would assume that people would get all his references and know what he was talking about, and he had uh, sometimes uh, just side tra- he would get the uh, side discussions on where he'd give his opinions on all sorts of philosophical issues. So I think if you're studying economics, say in your regular university course, you won't be used to this. So, But once you get used to it, once you see that the ideas aren't really that hard to understand, they're really commonsensical ideas, then once you get the main points, you can just keep going over and over the text and you'll always come up with new stuff, but you'll be able to understand the basics pretty much right away. And of course, for purposes of our discussion, we are using the Scholar's Edition, which was published by the Mises Institute in 1998, but originally published by Mises in 1949. And that includes an introduction written by him that same year of publication, David. And I notice. A couple of things you alluded to earlier. First of all, he points out that economics is the youngest of the social sciences, by which I means I think for for really for well into the 20th century, it was scarcely considered a standalone discipline. 
as Sean Rittenauer and I discussed last week. And also, I noticed in the introduction, he gets in a little dig, I believe, against the uh, sort of the economic trends of his time in that profession where he says, uh, you know, in the introduction where he says, one must study the laws of human action and social cooperation as the physicist studies the laws of nature. And of course, we're seeing today, uh, for example, in the MMT movement, there are lots of people who just who just flat out don't think there are laws of economics. Oh, yes, that was uh, people who don't think there are laws of economics at all. That goes back to one of his primary targets was the uh, German historical school. And they, just like the people you mentioned now, they didn't like the notion of laws of economics because if there are laws of economics, then they limit the power of the uh, state to do what it wants. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, there's one influential movement now, the MMT, I think Modern Monetary Theory, MMT, and they essentially say that the government doesn't doesn't have to worry about having enough money to uh, embark on projects. Say the government says, well, we'd like to say, give everybody a college education, but then opponents say, but this will cost a tremendous amount of money. So they say, oh, we don't have to worry about that. All we have to do is print the money because the government doesn't have to worry that it's going to go bankrupt if it prints too Mm -hmm. much money, unlike private people. Say, if I see all sorts of things I want to buy, I can't just keep going into debt and buying them because eventually all the the credit cards will max out my credit cards and they'll come after me. So they say, well, this doesn't happen to the government. So if you hold that sort of view, then you won't like the idea that there are laws of economics that would say you can't do that and and you'll suffer certain consequences if you try that. So Mises was very opposed to that. Now, when he said, you mentioned before, when he was saying the laws of, I want to connect two things. You said a little about laws. Some people say economics should be studied like laws of physics. And he also quoted him saying economics is the youngest of the sciences. Uh, What he meant there was that economics has a different sort of law from the other sciences. And the other sciences he thought were spinoffs from philosophy originally, and they just became independent ways of investigating nature. But economics is a distinct discipline because unlike the other physical sciences, It doesn't study things from the outside, but it can study human action, action from the inside. We all act so we know what action is, and we can study that. And he thought that wasn't what was done in the other sciences, so that's why it's the youngest of all the sciences. So he gets into chapter one, titled Acting Man, with a a bit of psychology. And it struck me that the, uh, you know, psychologists and behavioral economists ought to actually take an interest in what he has to say here. So he opens really the book conceptually. And as an aside, as as Dr. Rittenauer and I mentioned last week, one of the beautiful things about this book is you is you see sort of his finest and fullest and uh, uh, exposition of various concepts, whether that's his money in banking or, or socialism or the origins of money or method or praxeology, all of these things have sort of culminated for him career-wise at this point by 1949. So if you only read Human Action and none of his earlier works, let's say socialism or the theory of money and credit, you would really get the best sense of what he thought later in life and later in his career here. So when he opens with a chapter called Acting Man, you get the sense, David, that he has really thought this out and perfected it. So he talks about the idea that human action arises because we feel some sort of uneasiness and we sense that we could somehow improve our conditions around us. And so we take some sort of purposeful action 
to alleviate it. Now, it, does all of this belong in an economics treatise, or is this is this uh, apparently not so simple as we think? Oh, yeah. Well, the reason he puts that in is that he takes this to be action, to be the basic concept of economics, and he's going to try to deduce the body of economic theory from the concept of action plus a few subsidiary postulates. So <clears throat> this for him is not just some uh, philosophical side path, but this is the basis of the whole discipline. And we can see this, for example, in, say, when we're studying uh, the theory of value, utility, he isn't, as in the neoclassical uh, economics, just taking kind of uh, utility scales as somehow given to people. You just start with certain scales, and then you have them all out there, and then you do various kinds of mathematical calculations on them. But he tries to show how it's always action. We're always in our situation, things are not perfect. There's always something we can try to improve our situation. We can try to make things better. If, say, things aren't going so well for us, we still have the question, can, how can things be made less bad than they might otherwise be? So we're always faced with choice and then from that, we can rank the various alternatives we have, and we would then choose the one that best enable us to relieve our uneasiness, which would rank highest among our preferences. So I think it's, it's much uh, a much better way of doing things than the standard way. He doesn't just jump into utility theory, he shows the whole basis of how utility theory in in action and how this is just a basic part of the human condition. One of the most essential parts of human beings is human beings is that human beings act. Well, so he quickly takes pains to disabuse us of this rational actor idea that still plagues economics today. That human action isn't necessarily rational in the ordinary sense in which we use the word, but what he means here is that it's volitional. Human action is is volition. It's, it has a purpose to it. It doesn't necessarily mean that we are these rigid sort of rational economic automatons walking around acting in our best interest. It just means that we're acting out of volition. Yeah, yes, that's right. I mean, uh, many people will contrast various kinds. They'll say, well, we could think of some people who are very carefully calculating what to do, or they're thinking things over very in a very painstaking way. And others, yeah, like, are, Sher- like Sherlock Holmes, rash. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And others are just impulsive; they just do whatever seems spur of the moment. But for Mises, as what matters is just that you have some goal, some purpose, you think that there's a means, a way you can achieve that purpose. So he sa- so he gives cases such as you might people might take to be irrational in ordinary conversation. I mean, supposing, say, somebody just has an impulse. He's, it, Mises was very interested in psychoanalysis. He knew Freud personally. So he says, suppose somebody has some impulse that can be explained by psychoanalysis. He just feels like going out and killing somebody. So this counts as action as long as he has the goal, which is to kill the person. He has some means in mind to do it. So it doesn't matter what is the psychological origin of the goal that it doesn't have to be traced to some kind of reasoning process that how the person has arrived at the goal. We just know the person has a goal. He thinks there's a certain way he can achieve that goal. So that's an action. And it doesn't have to be the means. He can be wrong about what will 
enable him to achieve the action. He could just have all sorts of kind of some pretty crazy belief. Imagine somebody who thought if he bangs his head against the wall ten times that'll result in his winning the lottery. We would say, Oh well that, yeah, it's crazy. He thinks that but that still counts as action. He has the goal. His goal is to win the lottery. And he thinks banging his head enable him to do that, so that's an action. Well, he makes a couple of pretty sweeping pronouncements uh, in this chapter. One is that causality is really our only suitable method for studying the world around us. I'm not sure that mystics, for example, would accept that. Uh, And he also basically says that praxeology is universal. So discuss these two and how he arrives at these. Oh, well, when he says causality, what he has in mind there is uh, when we want to do something, we have to think there's a way that will enable us to do that. We have a goal. We think this will enable us to do this. So we have some sort of view that doing such and such will enable me to get that. So that's what he means by causality. We think something will produce something else. So I don't think he, he's not uh, really assuming any particular analysis of causality. He just says, this is really how we we get things. And then, uh, so, and, that, and the other one was... Uh, the idea that praxeology is universal. Oh, well, he says that Obviously, most people haven't studied praxeology as a formal science, but the categories of action and choice are ones that all people use. We, everyone acts and has goals and in, has means to achieve these. And then when, they, uh, when they're acting in this way, when they're trying to act, they're carrying out, they're putting into effect the principles of praxeology, they went going on later and showing how the uh, law of diminishing marginal utility is derived. Uh, this is something that people do in their action. They probably, unless they've studied economics, they won't know it under that name, but they'll be applying it in their own life. So it's universal in the sense that we all apply it in our daily life. We all use praxeology. It's just like the character in Moliere's play who said that he, he, he had been speaking prose all his life and didn't realize that people are using praxeology in their life, whether they think of it in that way or not. Well, I think it's an example of why you need to read this book, ladies and gentlemen, how, why you need to recommend it to others, because it really does give you a different kind of framework for looking not only at economics, but at, at, at the broader uh, branch of praxeology. And this leads us, David, into chapter two, which from my perspective is the densest and most difficult part of this section of the book anyway. It's all about epistemology. It is entitled The Epistemological Problems of the Sciences of Human Action. And this, of course, is where he really takes us into the differences between praxeology and history and social sciences versus uh, the natural sciences and makes an important distinction about a priori knowledge, which, of course, uh, applies to disciplines like logic, like math, like praxeology, but not to natural sciences. So, David, kind of tell us, what's what's our big takeaway? What's the core of Chapter 2 here about epistemology? Oh, yes. Well, one thing, uh, Jeff, I, I say, uh, you know, this is this is the best chapter. This is the most fun chapter, actually, not, not the most difficult. This okay. is the one that keeps me in business. This is my this is the best <laughs> one. Well, what he does there, first, he contrasts history with the sciences. So, say we have history consists of particular events, uh, like say you're on the phone talking to me, or I'm talking to you, and we have all sorts of events. So, we can try to have not only 
uh, list all the events, kind of have a chronology, say this happened in this year, this happened in this year. We can try to have explanations of those events, say why did those events happen? Uh, it, so we have explanations of particular events. Then on the other side, we have the sciences, which are trying to come up with general laws, not only say why did specific events have, but why are there generally repeated patterns that we find? Uh, say, in physics, why is it that two masses will attract each other with certain gravitational force? So we have attempt to find general laws. Then within the sciences, we have a division between sciences that are concerned with ex with general laws for particular events that they're trying to explain particular things that happened in nature, repeated things that happened in nature, and they're purely what we just call purely a priori discipline. These give us things that we can figure out just by thinking about them, such as mathematics or logic, they don't require or they don't reference to particular events at all. And Mises thinks that we can develop economics as an a priori discipline of this kind just by thinking about action, what's involved in the concept of action. We can work out an a priori structure that has to be supplemented, though, by some uh, subsidiary postulates. But once you put those in, everything is, again, figured out a priori. So it's really a contrast between studying the history, studying particular events, and then economics is studying action, which is not we're not concerned with particular actions, but just general truths about all actions. And this is Mises argues that this can be studied just by thinking about action. So that's what he means by a priori. Uh, a priori means from before. But when he means human action or uses that term, he's talking about something different than natural phenomena. Right, human action is a different category. Yes, that's right. Because, say, we're looking at uh, non-human action. Say, we're lo we're looking. Say, uh, you have a billiard where you're playing pool, and you see one billiard ball hitting another one, or you see one golf ball, some a golf stick strikes a ball, and you see the the golf ball going in a certain direction. So, the golf ball is not thinking or saying, well, I've got to go this way, or maybe it would be nice to play a trick on this player and get the, I'll go into the sand trap. <laughs> the, ball, we, the ball is just following certain laws of physics. And if we're interested in studying those laws, we could only observe this what, from the out side, we just see there the ball is going a certain way. We can't get into the ball, the, the golf ball's mind. It doesn't have one. But human beings aren't like that. We, we not only are making physical motions when we do something, but we have purposes and we think we have means that we think will help us attain those purposes. We know this because we're acting ourselves, so we can study action in a different way from the physical sciences. Now, I'll mention here, because I think it's a historic point of historical interest, this went against Aristotle and some of his followers in this way, that Aristotle thought that although true say that the physical bodies don't have minds, 
the concept of purpose still applies to nature. We can talk about things, doing things in nature, doing things for a purpose. They're after the say, way an acorn is growing into an oak because that's what its nature is, where the nature would be guiding it to grow into an oak. So Mises didn't like that idea at all. He thought, oh no, this is all wrong, that action just applies to human beings, that the nature we can't talk about, we shouldn't talk about nature having purposes apart from human action. This is one point where really he differed from uh, Murray Rothbard, because Rothbard was a more Aristotelian. He thought that the, he wouldn't have rejected uh, this notion of purpose in nature, but Mises does. He said, we're explaining this physical science completely different from human action, that the only purposes in nature are human purposes. So David, as he gets into this chapter, of course, he, he brings up what he calls the principle of methodological singularism, which is a, a different way of saying individual methodology, I suppose. And, and so everything you've been saying up to this point, we have to understand in terms of Mises is talking about looking at individual action, not collective or group action or aggregates, as we often see in, in econ. And he actually has a, a statement on page 45 of the book for people who are reading along against universalism. And it's something that's actually repeated not only at a few different points throughout this book, but in different uh, writings throughout his, his varied career, this this uh, Misesian case against universalism. So talk about what he means here by the principle of methodological singularism. Oh, yes. Well, what he means there is that suppose you want to study action in the way I've been talking about, you want to know what is the nature of action. So what we do is we study, we just take any action you want. So you evacuate all the particular features of that action. Say, what is the general structure that applies to this action as well as any other action? And in doing that, you're considering you're an individual you're not a collective, it's only individuals act. So what you'd be doing, this is methodological individuals, and you're talking, you'd be getting this a priori structure of action, you're talking about any action of a particular individual, and you're saying, what are the features of that action? This will enable you to understand all actions because you're not concerned with particular actions you're concerned with the general structure that applies to all actions. So that's why in studying the general feature of an action, you, you'll be getting the structure that applies universally to all actions. Well, when I think about this chapter and I think about epistemology, two things come to mind. First of all, as you mentioned earlier, Economics doesn't normally start with this stuff at all. It goes straight into graphs and charts and models and numbers. Uh, so it ignores epistemology, so to speak. And number two, David, is if Mises is right here or largely correct, doesn't that rest modern, whatever we want to call neoclassical economics, on a very shaky framework? Because modern economics is generally not in agreement with Mises here. Oh, oh, yes, that, that's right. See, the way they do things, <clears throat> they'll just construct arbitrary models, and then they try to, say, test these and say, how does this apply? Is this confirmed in reality? Uh, say, we, our model says such and such uh, should happen. Then we say, does this happen? So media says, oh, no, that's wrong. What you would get there is you could come up with, you, you would come up with such and such has happened at particular times. Uh, say we know uh, that prices have risen or fallen in particular for particular goods at various times. 
But that won't get you any general laws. That'll just get you particular items that have happened on individual occasions. But you won't be able to get any general laws. The way you get general laws in economics is to proceed in the way he does in human action by elaborating a whole structure of what's involved in the concepts of action, what's involved in action. And he didn't think there was a way of get a, a different way of getting laws. He didn't think you could just come up with empirical laws of economics that you, you as they would try to do in the neoclassical economics. They would say, well, we've got our model now we're testing it out so we can come up with laws. For example, uh, the French economist Thomas Piketty has said, well, there's a law that he claims based on certain statistical data that he has, and it's been, but he claims, well, he can show that uh, the percentage of income going to capital will rise as capitalism develops. According to Mises, you couldn't have such, that kind of law that you could say such and such has happened about the percentage of income going to capital in various years, but you wouldn't be able to get a, a general law from that. The only what the only general laws in economics are praxeological ones, and, and thus individualistic in approach. Yes, I mean, say example. I mean, suppose you say. Something like uh, Germany invaded uh, Russia on June 22nd, 1941. So it isn't that the country of Germany acts in mm -hmm. some sort of collective entity. It's uh, Hitler, who was the leader, German leader, gave certain orders, and as a result, the brothers people did things. The result was the invasion. But it isn't that the collective acts is somehow some entity apart from the individuals. Right. And, and this is also the chapter where he introduces the concept in the German word of wertfree, meaning value-free, that all of this, everything we're talking about in the epistemological uh, arena here is, is observational. It's not normative. It's not uh, based on any overarching value to something that this is purely uh, scientific in that sense of the word, value-free. Oh, oh, yes, this is one of the most important uh, notions in Mises' whole way of looking at, e at economics, is that in economics, we're studying the values people have, the subjective value theory, we're trying to explain action by the terms of the values, people have their preferences. But in doing that, we're making scientific assertions about people's values. We're not imposing our own values or going on our own, basing on our own values. It isn't, say, we know uh, say Mises like the free market, so he's going to say, well, I like the free market, so I'm going to come up with a science that supports the free market. Let's say a Marxist economist could say, uh, I don't like the free market, so I want to help the proletariat. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to come up with a, a science that will help them based on my values. Now, the, <clears throat> the view that many people have that Mises has is is irrational, is a revolt against reason, is that people don't think there are objective uh, science in this way. They say all that we have is particular value systems and people will be trying to support them. And this is particularly true in economics. Some people say, well, you can always find economists on one or other side of an issue or another side, depending on what the values they have. But Mises said, no, no, this is right. It is certainly the case that the conclusions he comes up with on the basis of, of his analysis will support the free market, 
but that doesn't rest on his value judgment that just a scientific result. So suppose we say, for example, minimum wage laws cause unemployment. That's a strictly scientific statement. So if you then say, well, I don't want unemployment, so I think it's a mistake to have minimum wage laws, that would be a value mm-hmm. judgment, but it would it's based on the strictly scientific statement that isn't a value judgment. Minimum wage laws cause unemployment. And Chapter 3 is, in fact, entitled Economics and the Revolt Against Reason. And this is where, as you just now alluded to, he gets into this concept of polylogism. So what is polylogism, and why does Mises devote a a chapter, albeit a rather brief chapter, to polylogism? Uh, Well, as uh, I mentioned, we were talking about the basic concept that he's giving in 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 the whole book, and particularly in these first seven chapters, is that we have an a priori science of human action. This is the basis of economics. So this isn't going to be that big a claim if it turns out that there are different groups that have different ways of reasoning. Suppose somebody said, well, you know, you say there's an a priori structure of human reason that's universal, but in fact, that's not right. There are different classes. They workers, proletarians have a different logic from capitalists, or there are different racial groups that have different logic, or uh, people have different ways of reasoning depending on what historical era they're living in. So if you hold that sort of view, that'll knock out economic theories as Mises conducts economics. So he naturally argues against that, and he says, no, no, if you people really reason in the same way these concepts are universal that he's talking about. Of course, people have very different beliefs about things that vary in all sorts of ways, but the structure of action is still the same universally. Say we look at uh, societies very different from our own, we'll still find people or acting people or have goals and they have means to attain these goals. And he's very critical of theories that were popular around the time he was running. And there's still, there's still people who hold these today that say human beings really don't act on the basis of reason in the sense of having goals and trying to achieve them. There's some people say human beings just act on instinct, they just kind of, mm-hmm. or, well, I shouldn't say act on it because they, they don't really act, they just have feelings that inevitably draw them to behave in certain ways, or instincts that make them do things. So Mises says, no, that's wrong. And one view that was influential when he was writing is that there's a uh, primitive mentality that's completely different from the way people reason today. Of course, those views have gone out of fashion now in anthropology. If you use the word primitive, you can be taken out and shot. (laughs) Be canceled, right. But what strikes me, though, about this chapter is the modern analogy to this idea, like, well, speak your truth from your lived experiences. It, it sounds an awfully lot like the polylogism that Mises is fighting, that we all have our own logic, our own forms of reason. And of course, Marxists in his day and uh, still today want to attack logic and reason as mechanisms for truth-finding, because as we started the show with, if, if there really are, let's say, objective laws to economics, and that's bad for statists and Marxists and people with grandiose plans, to do things legislatively by fiat, which might in fact violate those laws. So I was struck rereading this chapter the other night, and uh, it's short, uh, that, you know, this idea of your truth. There's no such thing in Mises' mind. And I think, I think he would argue today that polylogism is a very dangerous mentality. It makes us think that we're all 
Uh, we all have our own separate logic based on, let's say, our racial characteristics or our gender or whatever it might be, and uh, not a recipe for harmony in society. Oh, oh, yes. I think one of the things you find is the phrase that I find really upsetting. People say something like, this is true for me. <laughs> I mean, and what they mean by that is that they hold such a view, or they, they take such a view to be true, but that isn't, doesn't mean something is true for individuals in the, in the sense that there are different realities that particular individuals well, have. Don't, don't, say, don't say that at your local objectivist meeting. Uh, I'll, I'll say that much. You're going to get slapped. Um, I, I want to talk about Chapter 4, uh, the category of action. Now, this is this is another relatively short chapter, but really, really interesting. I really enjoy these these cerebral short chapters. I mean, Mises is such a master. He just brings this stuff to life and makes you think. It's actually fun and invigorating to 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 reread some of this stuff. So he he starts once again, David, with this idea of felt uneasiness that this is the this is the impulse we want to change our circumstances, and, but that economics is is about men. It's about people and action. It's not about things and stuff and money. Oh, oh, yes, yes. I mean, this is, if you take, uh, say, m- uh, money, if you just take it as a physical thing, say, pieces of metal or pieces of paper, bank, certain marks on uh, a computer, this is money only because of the way people take it, the way people are acting on the basis of giving meaning to these physical entities. So at, we're always concerned in economics with action, how people explaining things through people, subjective values and their use of means to attain those, the ends according to their value scale so that the physical entities aren't significant economics uh, apart from how they enter into action, and he's he's introducing the to- the subject of value in in terms of ordinal preferences that we can't calculate values per se, but we can only understand an individual subjective or, or ordinal preferences. Oh, oh yes, this is this is uh, again one of the key ideas in human action. He says when we're facing alternatives. What we're doing is we rank the alternatives available to us, just as we're considering it at the time. Suppose I have a choice between I can eat an apple now or an orange. So I rank one over the other. It it isn't that there are units of value that I can calculate in. There aren't numerical units. Mm -hmm. It's all that we're doing in action is ranking alternatives one over the other. We talk about uh, trying to uh, relieve felt uneasiness. There aren't units of uneasiness that we can figure out, say, well, the orange has will satisfy five units of uneasiness and the apple only three, so I'll take the orange. It's just that we rank one over Mm -hmm. the other. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to remember that in this introductory part of the book, we are strictly looking at the individual. We're not looking at so-called catalactics, which is exchange between one or more individuals, market exchanges. We're we're just talking about, uh, you know, what's the, what, what's behind praxeology. And so in this chapter four, of the book, uh, Mises introduces this really, I think, fascinating idea of action as as an exchange. In other words, when humans act to alleviate this uneasiness because they imagine perhaps a better state of affairs for themselves, uh, they're they're trading sort of one state of affairs for hopefully a more satisfactory one, and that we can actually view this, uh, we can view human action as a form of exchange, even at the individual level. Oh, oh, yeah, yes, as, as you say, it's a very interesting idea. You said that, say, if you're, you have your state of uneasiness, so you're in a state at a time, this is your condition. And if your action is successful, then 
you're better off than you were before. So you've one state of affairs has been traded for another. So you could take, I think, an unusual way of looking at things. He's taking the existing state of affairs, the one that's traded for the one that's realized as, but as kind of the cost mm. and the result is what's been produced. And if, if your satisfaction is higher, you're, relieved uneasiness so there's what he calls a psychic profit you gained on the deal so it's just like in it say if you have an exchange with two pers two people you can say i'm giving you one good in your in return for your giving me something else so you have an exchange there and we can both profit you can take exchange in this extended way as exchanging for an individual one, your existing state, or some other state, which results from your action. And of course, all of this implicates our next subject in Chapter 5, which is time. And as Mises tells us, you know, praxeology requires an understanding of the temporal character of what human beings do. So, David, tell us a little bit about time. Now, we don't get into interest necessarily in this, in, in chapter five, but we get into the idea of time and human action. For example, action implies a future, that you're not going to be dead, for example. Uh, I'm planning on doing things tomorrow on Friday, and uh, my actions depend on me not being dead. Uh, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that... W- I think this chapter starts to uh, allow the reader to to figure out that we have to economize time. And we we all understand this, I think, inherently by virtue of our mortality. But but to understand it more concretely in terms of praxeology and then how that fits into economics, it would be to say, David, for example, that, you know, a person might prefer their dream house at age 40 over age 90, and there's a reason for that. So, so what is Chapter 5 all about? Oh, well, I think what he has in mind there is, say we have, we were talking about earlier in action, we have a goal, and then we have what are the means to achieve this goal. So the goal, since we don't have it now, otherwise there would be no need to action. We already have a goal. The goal is something in the future. Say, I want such and such. So the goal is in the future, and then we have how do we achieve the goal? And that would implies a process of but, but, achieving okay. the goal. So but, but David, let me interrupt you briefly. When you say we're talking about the future, that could mean something just as short as the next 30 seconds I'm going to walk to the fridge and get a Diet Coke. It doesn't have to mean a lofty or far away future. Oh, oh yeah, yes, that's right. When Mises talks about future, what he has primarily in mind is there's a temporal structure to action. The goal is out ahead, and I want to get that action in the future. And that structure where you have the past of the action, the past is the time before the action, then the period of, in which the action takes place, and then the realization of the action, that's the time as the individual is experiencing that, and Mises distinguishes that from time in a kind of physical sense, say, as we would study it in physics, where it's just motion of some sort of going on, just in some kind of physical process. The time is individual to the actor. So, so the individual... You know, two actions of a of an individual are never synchronous, so to speak. They 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 succeed one another. They they happen one after the other. And of course, just like other factors in his life, time is potentially scarce. He has to economize it. Oh, oh, yes, yeah, yes. I mean, we we can't achieve all our goals in an unlimited way. We have, say, we have a period of t- uh, twenty four hours in a day, so we have to decide how. If we use the time to achieve one goal, then there'll be less of it to achieve other goals. So just as we have different goals that we want, so if I concentrate on one goal, I can't concentrate on other goals 
At the same time, we have to realize also we have the time available to us is limited, so we can only try to achieve a certain number of our goals. Time is scarce and has to be considered something to be economized on. I have to consider that if I use an hour for one thing, that'll give Mm -hmm. me less time to achieve something else. And of course, what time gives us in life or uh, or the ticking amount of time we have left is uncertainty. That's chapter six. Uh, We don't know what the future holds, and we don't know how the world and uh, the physical world and other people around us will necessarily respond to different things. So uh, chapter six, I think, dovetails with chapter five. Time and uncertainty are, are related and interrelated. Um, So uncertainty, including death, means that we have to consider probability. And that's really what uh, this chapter delves into. It's interesting to note, David, of course, that his brother Richard was a a very famous mathematician at Harvard who dealt in statistics and probability, actually wrote in that field a a famous text on this very topic. So I'm sure Mises, at least by osmosis, learned some stats and probability from his brother. Oh, oh yes. Well, he, what he says about probability theory in this chapter is very much in line with his brother's theory, but he modified the theory somewhat. He didn't really change, but he, he expressed it in a non-mathematical form, and in some ways he made and it... thank God for that. <laughs> ...made it simpler. And what the key thought here is that as you know, in uh, probability theory, in the mathematical theory of probability, they have various theorems. Say, if you have, uh, say, if you toss a fair coin in the air a hundred times, what are the chances that you'll get uh, 25 heads and 75 tails? So you can work out an, the answer to that mathematically. Mm-hmm. So what Mises, again, following his brother, said is that that sort of mathematical probability, which he calls class probability, applies only to classes of, of the events where you just know, say, as an example I gave with the coin, you know the, the mathematical theory that will give me answers to that. But if you don't have repeated series of the same event, Mm -hmm. then he thinks mathematical theory of probability doesn't apply at all. There he he talks about case probability, and case probability is non-mathematical. Suppose I say, what is the probability that uh, Joe Biden will be the Democratic nominee for president? So there... It's a unique event. I couldn't say, according to Mises, well, the odds are one in ten that Joe Biden will be the nominee, or eight in ten, because that, according to Mises, wouldn't have any meaning. Mathematical probability only applies to the general classes. So could object to that. He said, well, don't people say that all the time? People will you can look on various websites and you'll see estimates of what are the chances Biden will win the, nom- the nomination. But here, Mises says we're not really using mathematical probability, even though we're, say, we're giving certain figures, we're just giving subjective estimates of we have strong beliefs okay. of, uh, in something that we're trying to just express a certain belief, but the theory of probability doesn't apply. So this leaves the important distinction between risk and uncertainty. Risk is means cases where we can figure out what the probabilities are mathematically, and uncertainty is where we can't do this. We could just say uh, something might happen, but we can't give mathematical estimates. And Mises takes uncertainty to be a pervasive feature of action. So let me just build on this a little bit. The first category, class probability, we could say, take a class, let's say Americans. 
There, the average life expectancy of an American is 72 years. Now, of course, we, we understand that that's skewed by uh, people who might die at infancy. It's skewed by people who live to be 112. But nonetheless, we could come up with a number for the class. Now, that won't tell us you know, how, how, you know, if we say it is 72, that's the average. That, now, that doesn't mean that that newborn baby today is guaranteed living 72 years. We all understand that this is a probability for a class of, of people we've chosen like Americans. Okay, fine. Now, the second category, when you say, will Biden be the next president? Well, there's, there, there's not a class here. So it's the, the normal rules of risk and uncertainty or, or risk calculation don't apply. Um, I, I'm thinking here of Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who writes on this, uh, the author of The Black Swan. So some people think that the, the horrible uh, stock market and housing crash of 2008 was a black swan event. In other words, an event that was not uh, necessarily foreseeable or predictable because there were so many potential factors in its cause. So help me understand where where does a, a black swan event fit into this? What what's what what is what does Mises tell us? That that's a very interesting question. I mean, the, uh, Mises I think would view the matter somewhat differently from uh, Talib. The way Talib takes it is he accepts the notion that probability theory applies to individual events. So he's differing from Mises, but what he says is that uh, probability theorists, in general, people who use probability theory, don't take sufficient account of events that are outliers. So say you have in, you draw kind of a, a Gaussian curve, and you say, here's the chances this is going to happen, according to probability theory, the chances are going to be 80% within this range, maybe there's a 2% chance it could be something on the outside. So Talib says, well, it's a mistake. People using probability theory just dismiss these outlying events. What it means is you say you can't use probability theory at all mm. in this kind of case. So it's a bit, Mises is a bit rather more radical Mises would say uh, it's not, say, when people didn't forecast the collapse of the stock market in 2000, in two, monetary system 2008, it isn't that they forgot to put in this outlier in probability. It's that you can't apply probability theory to such an event at all. Okay. Okay. So... Does that mean praxeological knowledge helps us understand at the individual level uh, or, or to predict the, uh, the outcome of some sort of act, but it, it can never help us uh, predict quantitative matters? Yeah, yes, that's right. There are, according to me, there are no quantitative laws in economics because there are no in his constants in okay. human action that enable us to have such laws. Say, I could say uh, we have laws that you always choose your most highly valued action, but there aren't laws that will say you value your most highly valued action, say, 1.5 times as much as your second most highly valued action. There, there aren't quantitative okay. constants. So r wrap this up for us. Chapter 7, the final chapter of Part 1 of this book, is entitled Action Within the World, and this chapter is all about utility. It's all about this praxeological notion of utility, which we, we you know, what might also call subjective use value of something. Uh, marginal utility factors into this chapter. Uh, what, what's the key takeaway from Chapter 7? Uh, this is very much along the lines of what we've been talking about earlier, that when you're acting, you're trying to achieve your most highly valued goals. So you say, well, what will enable me to achieve that? So supposing, say, you have a number of units of a particular good, say you have 10 cows. Of course, if I had 10 cows, I wouldn't know what to do with them. I'd be completely cowed by that. But supposing I have 
10 cows. So D- David, your neighborhood I, in Los Angeles is not particularly rural. Uh, no, it would be an utter failure there <laughs> if I put in cows. But supposing I say, well, I would devote my first, the first cow to such and such a use, that would be my, say, I want to get milk for my family. So that's the highest value use. So then if I have another unit, I would put it to a less highly valued use because I use the first one would go to the most highly valued use. So as I have more and more units of the good, they would go to less and less valued uses. So the, that's what's called the marginal utility, meaning the utility of the last unit would diminish. So, David, obviously this is all an exposition of what is already, I guess, a 70- or 80-year-old concept now, by now, when he writes this book of, of marginal utility. Um, so he gets into the idea here of utility as something that can't be measured. So action is choices between alternatives, but action does not measure utility. So talk about this idea that we that we can't calculate values. Yes, well, what he has in mind there is that when we say why we talk about diminishing utility, Mises says this is not a psychological matter in this way, that some people think, well, they think marginal utility diminishes because Imagine this case, suppose you have an, some, you're eating ice cream cones, so you have an ice cream cone, you'll feel good about that. But if you keep eating ice cream cones, eventually you'll get sick. They, so they think this is a psychological matter, you just have a, eventually you'll get satiated, you'll have all the ice cream you want. So as you eat more and more, you'll that psychological satisfaction, you will keep going lower and lower. So Mises says, no, no, this isn't what's involved. What's involved is just purely ordinal choices. You're ranking one use higher than the other. It's not a psychological matter at all. That's why it can't be measured, because you're just ranking one use over the other. Now, the other point I want to mention, which is very I think very interesting one. This is where Mises is introducing, he says this is a subsidiary assumption or postulate that the uh, labor has disutility or leisure is a good. So what he means there is that we could conceive of a world in which, say, you labor to achieve things you want and then you keep applying units. So you're Maybe your first hour will be devoted to what you value highest, and you keep you'll get lower and lower values. You keep laboring, but we could conceive a world is as long as your labor is giving you something you want, you'll keep going as long as this is physically possible. So he says this is not a world we're actually living in. Most people will want to stop laboring. They'll one leisure. So as the value of uh, of what you're using your labor for goes down, the value of leisure goes up. But he said this doesn't have to be the case. Now, I find, you know, in the years I've been teaching this, there are a lot of people who don't like this idea. One argument that's sometimes given again, it is not, is, I think it's an interesting one. It's good to see what's wrong with it. People say, well, look, we don't need to have this extra assumption that labor has this utility because we know that since the utility of labor will diminish because it'll be labor will be used for less and less mm-hmm. valuable goods. So it follows from that that leisure is going up as labor is diminishing. But can you see this is all wrong because it's assuming what is at issue that leisure is good to everybody and to what Mises says, no, it could be that some people don't take leisure as a good. So then even though labor would be, that labor would be going down as it's applied to 
more and more uses, it wouldn't be that the value of leisure is going up because people don't take those people don't take leisure to be a good at all. So if you argued in the way I was suggesting, you'd be begging the question. So that's why Mises says this has to be introduced as a separate assumption because it's one that could be conceivably denied. So, so rather than thinking of labor as a good, we think of labor as a means, let's say, rather than yes. an end. So we, 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 if, if we go to work, it's because we prefer that paycheck to uh, the leisure we might get from foregoing the paycheck by staying home all day, right? Right. But right. that's so, different. That's not a good, per se. No, no, that's right. We're applying it. The uses that we're getting from our labor would be going down more and more. And if we take leisure to be a good, then as we apply more and more units of labor, then the value of leisure would rise. And we, so you'd have to offer more money or more desirable goods to get the person to work more. Right. So we economize labor just as we economize other material factors. Yes, yes, that would always be the case, even if we didn't take leisure to be a good, we would still economize labor in that we would use labor for our most, achieve our most valued goals. Yeah, and next, and next time you have surgery, you don't want your surgeon to have been up 72 hours straight, for example, <laughs> uh, just to earn, earn a little bit of the you know, extra surgical fees or something. So I, I want to conclude towards the end of this chapter with, I, I thought this just amazing little point that Mises makes, which is that production is not what we think of as an act of creation. We think someone like Steve Jobs and the talented people around him came up with this idea of an iPhone, and it was going to be this really cool tactile thing that we hold in our hands, and it was going to browse and do email and work as a phone and a camera and, a, and hold, you know store apps and do all these cool things, and no one had really thought of this, so they had sort of created it out of whole cloth. Whereas Mises says, well, production is just transforming existing elements, you know, arranging them, combining them in new ways. So, it's, so this, is, this is one of man's methods. But you're, not, you're rearranging, you're not creating. So, so what, is, what does this mean? How should we think of production? Well, yes, well, what Mises meant there was, I mean, supposing, uh, say, someone uh, came up with the idea of an iPhone and he didn't do anything, that wouldn't be production, in production, you have to take physical materials and based on your idea, you would transform the, the physical materials into the iPhone. So production is a process taking place in the world. It's you're making things. And we, we have uh, just limited resources. It's just certain physical quantities of various things that we have to combine to uh, make something. So ideas aren't scarce because an idea can be used by people over and over, but the physical process is something that is scare inv involves scarcity that we have to combine these means of production into a product. When you say it reminds me of uh, Hans Zenholtz, used to say uh, on the other side, when a bomb drops on a building, it doesn't destroy anything. It just rearranges things. Mm. So this is mm -hmm. the inverse of what Mises, Mises is saying. When production is, you're arranging things. So Senholt was saying, well, bombing is rearranging well, that's very Krugman-like. We should we could just rearrange things, and then we could all get rich re-rearranging them. Uh, you know, David, th that that wraps up part one, the first 142 pages of this incredible book. I hope some of you have taken the time to to embark on this course of reading it with us, either for the first time or or perhaps a second or third time. Uh, I hope some of you have bought it at Mises.org at our bookstore, and again, use the code HAPOD for Human Action Podcast to get a discount there. Uh, if you need to catch up, the first 142 pages are not that tough. Uh, you can get through them in in a few sittings, I think. And next week, we're going to get into part two of the book, which is actually a bit shorter. That's only three chapters, about uh, 60 or 70 odd pages. Part two is called Action Within the Framework of Society. Our guest for that is going to be Dr. Bob Murphy. And it's going to give you an opportunity 
as we discussed, uh, to have experts and economists like David Gordon and Bob Murphy and Sean Rittenauer and Pear Byland and many others to help you get through this book, to help make sense of it, and, and more, most importantly, to help you enjoy it, because you're going to be a far better person as a result of having read this book, and it's, it's going to broaden you. It, it's going to feel good, like doing something difficult, like going to the gym, and it's going to make you more knowledgeable about economics than 99% of the population walking around out there. So all that said... Dr. David Gordon, thank you so much. I really enjoyed speaking with you today. Oh, thanks, Jeff. It was great being on the program. Thanks a lot. The Human Action Podcast is available on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and on Mises.org. Subscribe to get new episodes every week and find more content like this on Mises.org.